The great hurdler impresses us by his grace and efficiency. We say that he has good form. But what do we mean by good hurdling form? How do we judge good form? How is good hurdling form acquired? Notice that the hurdles seem to interfere very little with the athlete's forward progress. The great speed to the hurdles and over the hurdles supplies the main clue. The hurdle race must be looked upon primarily as a sprint race. The hurdles must, of course, be cleared. Yet in clearing them, the athlete must make only those departures from good running style that are absolutely necessary. The athlete leaves the blocks like a sprinter. Nearing the hurdle, he rises slightly and leans forward toward the hurdle. This aggressive lean keeps the center of gravity low and permits him to drive forward rather than upward. The hurdles are never jumped. They are cleared with a powerful forward stride. Note that the head never rises during hurdle clearance. The lean does more than keep the center of gravity low. It permits all other points of form to be carried out. Thus the lean toward the hurdle is the very heart of hurdling technique. Correct lead leg action stems directly from our general principle of keeping as close as possible to sprinting form. Lead leg action amounts to an exaggerated stride. The knee is lifted higher for hurdle clearance. Notice the similarity between the action of the lead leg over the hurdle and the normal running. Particularly note that the lead leg is kept in alignment. The flex knee of the lead leg at this point is of great significance. The beginner tends to straighten his leg and to kick as he approaches the hurdle. Over the safe side of the hurdle, the lead leg must be cut down sharply. Both this cut down and body lean are needed to bring about correct body angle for sprinting to the next hurdle. Thus, the lead leg follows normal sprinting form with two minor deviations, a greater knee lift for clearance, a cut down to help recover body angle for sprinting. In hurdle clearance, it is the trail leg that shows the greatest deviation from its normal sprinting action, but this deviation is brief. The trail knee is brought out of alignment so that the upper leg is parallel to the hurdle. We can easily see that this deviation is needed, for if the knee were to be brought through with normal sprinting form, the body would have to be much higher over the hurdle. Only a very limber athlete can carry out this action. But the trail leg's departure from correct sprinting form is brief. The first move of the trail leg is like a normal sprint stride, only harder, because the stride over the hurdle is about four feet longer than a normal stride. Once the trail leg is clear of the hurdle, it comes back into alignment in preparation for a full, regular stride. Much has been written and said about the timing of the trail leg off the hurdle, but this problem of timing can be greatly simplified if we seek the answer from our general principle. That is, whenever possible, good sprinting form is maintained. In normal running, the legs are always equidistant from the body. This is the key to timing. That is, when the left leg is back, the right leg is forward, and vice versa. The legs cross only at one point, under the body weight. The relationship between legs is kept over and off the hurdle. The beginner is likely to lose timing when he comes off the hurdle. A hurried trail leg will tend to put both legs forward at the same time, thus interfering with normal running. This picture suggests a vital point. Good timing requires both body lean and a cut down of the lead leg. Thus, in judging the correctness of trail leg timing, the guide is simple. Good running form should be maintained. The correct arm action over the hurdles is also governed by the effort to keep good sprinting form. In normal running, the opposite arm and leg work together. This compensating action helps preserve alignment and balance. The harder the stride, the more extreme the arm action. Now the drive over the hurdle is a hard and long stride. Hence the compensating arm drive must also be harder and longer. One word of caution. The next stride, that off the hurdle, is not exaggerated. Hence the recovery of the arm is not as extreme as the forward thrust. Thus all points of form stem from the effort to minimize the interference of the obstacles and to make the hurdles a sprint race. Anyone who wants to learn to hurdle should have the fun of doing so. But success in hurdling is most likely to go to the man who is tall and limber. And most of all, there must be fine natural speed. 
The candidate for the hurdles does lots of running. The grass is a good place for much of this early work. Before he actually hurdles, he should have several weeks of daily running. During this period, his program is very similar to that of the sprinter. The great hurdler is an unusually limber athlete. Efficient technique requires that he be limber. Hence, stretching exercises form an important part of the athlete's work program. He must become increasingly limber. The exercises are progressive, going from gentle stretching to more strenuous work. It is highly important that the athlete be thoroughly warmed up each time before beginning his exercise routine. As the athlete runs by the hurdle in slow motion, we pause for an overall view of the problem of hurdle clearance. Remember, we want him to clear the hurdle with the least possible interference with the running effort. The crotch is close to the hurdle top and does not have to rise very much. Drive can be forward, not upward. The lead leg will not have to depart very far from normal sprint technique. The knee must go higher. It is the trail leg that will present the greatest clearance problem. Early coaching will emphasize the forward lean into the hurdle. The athlete will be taught the general principle that he must drive over the hurdle. A simple trial without a lean compared to one with a lean will quickly convince the athlete that efficient trail leg action requires a forward lean. Even the finest hurdlers continue to give special attention to the trail leg action. The exercise most use is one in which the lead leg is driven forward but outside of the hurdle. In this way, only the trail leg passes over the hurdle. When introduced to this exercise, the athlete is usually a little confused, but this difficulty is temporary. It arises simply from forgetting to first drive the lead leg forward. When this point is explained, the exercise is easily carried out. As our analysis indicates, the trail leg action is the greatest departure from normal sprinting form. This valuable exercise leaves the athlete free to concentrate on his trail leg. The knowledge that it can carry out the trail leg action gives the athlete the confidence so necessary to good hurdling. The hurdler must get the feeling that the high point of his forward drive is reached just before he reaches the hurdle. When directly over the hurdle, he must feel as if he is already coming down. Otherwise, he will float and not land in a position to sprint. The dimension of the hurdle itself serves as a rough guide to the landing area, which would result from correct hurdle clearance. Work over a single hurdle permits the athlete to concentrate on what he has learned without worrying about his stride pattern. This type of drill orients the athlete to the hurdle, and he will begin to look respectable if he is well conditioned, if he is drilled on trail leg action, and if he understands the nature of the event. Under racing conditions, all hurdlers must, of course, take three strides between hurdles. Yet in practice, the use of five slower and shorter strides between hurdles has a useful function. The pressure and speed necessary for three strides are removed, and the athlete is free to concentrate on efficient hurdle clearance. In carrying out this polishing drill, the athlete always leans and drives hard at each hurdle. The first hurdle is the most important hurdle of the race. Measurement is made to locate the takeoff distance from the first hurdle. This spot is prominently marked. Usually about seven feet is needed, the exact distance depending upon the athlete's height and speed. There must be sufficient room. A cramped takeoff interferes with the body lean so important to efficient clearance. Under the supervision of his coach, the athlete will drill constantly to strike the proper takeoff spot. He must work to make this ability almost second nature. Stride adjustments for the first hurdle must be made as early in the race as possible. This means that such adjustments should be made right at the start, at the blocks. The athlete must drill until these first strides are absolutely consistent. Only in this way can he approach the first hurdle with speed and confidence. When the early stride pattern becomes reliable, the athlete is ready for extensive drill on the first hurdle. In this task, confidence is half the battle. Here he works to approach the hurdle smoothly and without hesitation, to clear the hurdle efficiently with the very minimum departure from good sprinting form. The athlete who handles the first hurdle is far along. From the standpoint of form, the remaining hurdles will present no new problems. 
After mastery of the first hurdle, the main problems are those of condition, experience, and polish. Yet, even for the advanced hurdler, the first hurdle is always regarded as a critical part of the race. The hurdlers should join the sprinters for starting practice. Such practice is, of course, a necessary and valuable part of the hurdler's training. Moreover, it serves to emphasize the point that the hurdles event is a race. Reaction and speed are important. Though he must perform smoothly and efficiently with attention to technique, it is essential that he acquire the habit of moving fast and driving hard. The hurdler is fortunate if he has one or more teammates who are equally proficient. Competitive conditions can be simulated in practice. The chance to work under pressure quickly gains valuable experience for the athlete. Two, the stress situation brings to early coaching attention errors that might otherwise escape notice until late season. The exercise program is continued during the season. A thorough warm-up always precedes all stretching exercises. Constantly aware of the great importance of speed, the coach does all he can to increase sprinting ability. The heart of the workout remains fast work over several hurdles. In a routine practice session, an athlete cannot perform well over 10 hurdles and tends to lose form. Full flights, therefore, are reserved for the meets and the occasional time trial. The athlete who is prepared well can look forward to the thrill of competition. He goes to his marks with the knowledge that he is ready to give his best. It is now that he reaps the benefits of his many hours of training. Here are seen the results of the skills so carefully acquired and the conditioning program that was undergone. Win or lose, the athlete has gained. The high hurdler is usually called upon to run the low hurdles. Often he can perform this double well, but his ability to run the lows will not depend very much upon the hurdling skills he has developed in the highs. Instead, performance will depend more on his speed, stamina, and the conditioning that he has developed. The high hurdle of 42 inches presents a formidable barrier. The athlete standing by a low hurdle of 30 inches shows a remarkable contrast. His center of gravity is already well above the top of the hurdle. The height of the low hurdle is the key to what must be done. In accordance with our basic principle, we must deviate as little as possible from correct sprinting form. Because the low hurdle is less of an obstacle, its clearance demands very little departure from running form. Thus, the precise technique learned for the high hurdles is not used for the lows. It would represent needless departure from proper running style. Notice that for the low hurdle, the lean is hardly more than a normal body angle of the sprinter. In general, there is much less interference with the running effort. The lead leg remains in alignment and is lifted only enough for hurdle clearance. A quick landing puts the athlete in position to continue the running effort. In the high hurdles, considerable deviation is required of the trail leg. In the lows, the trail leg is lifted only enough to clear the hurdle. A greater lift would be a wasteful departure from running style. However, though the trail leg is not high over the hurdle, the knee is brought through to alignment. This action permits a full and efficient running stride. The opposite arm and leg always work together for balance. The clearance of a high hurdle is a very exaggerated stride and requires in compensation an exaggerated action of the arm opposite the lead leg. Low hurdle clearance is a less exaggerated stride. Hence, the arm action is also less exaggerated. The high hurdler reviews with his coach the style modifications he will need for the lows. There will be very little body lean. The lead leg lifts only enough for hurdle clearance. The trail knee rises just enough to clear the hurdle. Compensating arm action is less extreme. The general coaching principle remains the same. Is the hurdle approach without interruption? Does hurdle clearance occupy a minimum time? Is the athlete in a good running position when he comes off the hurdle? In many ways, the lows favor the sprinter. How does the hurdler meet this challenge? He does have some advantages. He is used to running toward a barrier at high speed. He has had training in regulating stride length. Most important, he should try to outcondition the sprinter. If he makes the needed adjustments, the hurdler will have an added chance to compete and to contribute points to his team. The hurdler can take pride in his achievement, for this event combines great skill, speed, and conditioning.
Okay. Hi, everybody. Let's start rewinding here. Watch everybody do hurdles backwards. Hey. How goes it? I'm Skip Alzheimer, uh, founder of the AV Geeks Archive, and um, thanks for coming out. Uh, coming out. Thanks for uh, watching me um, on this uh, Sunday night. It's very dreary in Raleigh, North Carolina, where the archive is located. Very rainy and gross, so it's nice to be inside. Um, so tonight, uh, what the AV Geek saw is a grab bag. It's films that we have not seen before, um, which means, as somebody pointed out, that some films might be very dry. Uh, that's kind of rolls with the territory. Uh, these are films, you know, uh, I have not, I have no experience with them. There might be some nudity that slips through. It might be some Disney content that slips through, which is what happened uh, last time and why YouTube kind of blocked our channel periodically because there was some Pixar, very early Pixar footage, and also some, like a very early Disney cartoon that um, I forgot it was a Disney cartoon, and so we got flagged. Um, and then also, you know, music will sometimes kick us off. But I appreciate you guys coming out, um, watching, turning your gaze to uh, this little channel. Uh, if you don't know who I am, I collect, I'm Skip Alzheimer, and I collect old educational films, and what we're watching tonight are literally 16 millimeter films uh, that I've pulled from a part of the archive that we just recently did some work on so we have more access to, uh, and behind me is a telecine, so this actually is uh, transferring the film from film to a video signal, and then the video signal we're actually... Uh, streaming or converting so we're taking technology film technology which is more than 100 years old and we're using uh, transfer equipment which is probably 10 years old 15 years old and streaming equipment and software that is cutting edge so um, for those of you who've joined me before you know anything can happen there can be uh, films flying everywhere there can be uh, um, weird glitches. Uh, I worked today earlier to actually try to, I'm going to switch films here, um, to actually try to address a problem we were having with lip sync and audio sync uh, on both the channels and a weird thumping sound that was showed up on um, people watching it on Firefox. And I think I fixed it. I mean, if I haven't, let me know. Um, there's so many opportunities for this to go wrong. Um, that you know, once we're in the midst of it, uh, if it does exist, then I'll make a note of it and try to fix it uh, by the next time we do this. Uh, so this is the next film we're watching. Uh, again, I haven't, I haven't totally checked my list to see, but these titles, I don't remember them. So there might be somebody who goes like, oh, I know that film. I've seen that film online, or I've seen you show that film somewhere. So I apologize if my memory has failed me, but I pulled these from a place that I just have not delved into yet. Um, essentially, what I used to do for the first 20 or so years is almost every Sunday, I would pull films, have people come over, we would drink beer, and then we would watch, you know, whatever. And so uh, it was usually just new stuff that I hadn't seen before, stuff I got on eBay or in auctions or whatever. And so... Uh, I kind of missed that, so I might start doing that more, uh, but I will still continue to do theme shows as they come up and have guests and things like that, because that's, that's fun as well. But, uh, yeah, so this next film, because basically I have 25,000 films, and I've only seen between five and 6,000 of them, so I gotta keep up, because I'm averaging getting a new film every day, uh, maybe two films every day, kind of depending. Um, so, I'm way behind. Um, so, uh, this next film is called VIPs, uh, Today's Secretaries. Um, and a lot of these are ones I'm like, what is this? This has got to be crazy. So, I don't know what this is. I have a feeling it's probably from the 70s or 80s, but I don't know, we'll see. So, here we go. Enjoy.
from around the world. Telephones are ringing in business offices. People are greeting business associates and new clients, scheduling appointments, answering correspondence, recording and evaluating business data, and making important business decisions. Who are performing these important daily business activities? More than 3,385,000 secretaries. And that's just in the United States. For 24 centuries, men worked as secretaries. It's just since the mid-1800s and the invention of the typewriter that women began to enter the secretarial force for the first time. Today, of the nation's 3,385,000 secretaries, there are approximately 33,000 male secretaries. Some very impressive people have been male secretaries. Billy Rose and Andrew Carnegie, Mark Twain, Woodrow Wilson, Henry Ford, Lyndon Johnson, and even Dustin Hoffman. Employment agency personnel in California have reported that good typing and shorthand have become such rare skills that their possessor can command $1,000 a month. Figures from the latest available U.S. Department of Labor Statistics area wage surveys report even higher salaries for executive secretaries in some areas. The largest employer in the nation is the federal government. A secretary generally enters with a GS-4 to a GS-7 rating, which means an annual salary ranging from over $8,000 to $15,000. The Department of Labor has reported that there will be more than 400,000 openings this year for secretaries. Behind the scenes in the entertainment business are 23,000 clerical personnel. This number will balloon to 37,000 by 1985 and will encompass a wide range of capabilities. Some will work as assistants to individual celebrities and others as secretaries to entire production companies. Secretaries in entertainment can work for radio and television stations, motion picture companies, record companies, professional sports organizations, and any number of related enterprises. Secretaries today can virtually write their own tickets, and one area they should look into is that of the 40 major theme parks in the United States, which did an estimated $750 million in business, drawing nearly double the attendance as professional football, baseball, and basketball combined. Aloha. That's a familiar greeting to the more than three million people who visited Hawaii last year. To the Sheridan hotels on Waikiki Beach, this means big business, superb restaurants, entertainment of every description, lavish reviews, dancing and luau's, banquets, receptions, and 4,531 beautiful view rooms and suites. This demands a professional, well-trained staff. VIPs like Mary Ann Graham Marr, Executive Secretary to the General Manager of the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. Mary Ann is on the telephone constantly with other VIPs, Sheridan's guests, and coordinates the Aloha Award for outstanding hotel personnel. When the Royal Hawaiian Hotel recently celebrated its 50th anniversary, Mary Ann's shorthand notes were included in the time capsule to be recovered in 25 years. Mary Ann's skills include 120 words per minute typing, as well as 120 words per minute shorthand. Another VIP is Sue Yabiku. While in school, I was offered part-time jobs doing secretary work for the ASL-CIO. I continued to work on my business skills and develop shorthand skills of 140 words per minute. Today, I am secretary to the Japan Area Director of Sales with the Sheraton Hotels in the Pacific. Last year, nearly 37 million people flew the friendly skies of United Airlines. The largest airline in the free world, United has nearly 50,000 very important employees. One of these employees is Carol Hampton secretary to the manager of in-flight services at Los Angeles International Airport. After completing her college secretarial program, Carol became a flight attendant for United Airlines, where she flew for six years. 
Today, Carol uses her secretarial training and still enjoys her extensive travel benefits. Carol's job involves telephone contact with airline personnel and the public, shorthand, typing, and composing correspondence. From 100 applicants, Carol was selected to participate in United Airlines Management Development Program. More than 23 million passengers arrived at Los Angeles International Airport last year, including many well-known celebrities. And one of Peggy Ho's jobs is serving as official hostess and representative for United Airlines. The very day the camera crew filmed Peggy, she met Marlo Thomas, Helen Hayes, and the governor of California. Peggy is a business college graduate who believes her secretarial skills opened important career doors for her at United Airlines 10 years ago. Fashion is big business and employs more than 6 million people involved in fashion designing, advertising, retailing, modeling, and the executive offices. At Janssen's World Headquarters, one of the people in the executive offices is Pat Jensen. Pat may be supervising the preparation of correspondence and reports for her department, handling students' requests for information about Janssen, assisting the publication editor as they prepare Janssen's employee publication, or preparing a special mailing to all Janssen stockholders. When Debbie Feller was in high school and taking business classes, she had no idea she was going to become an executive secretary. Today, she is the secretary to the national sales manager of the Mrs. Division and also secretary to the marketing director. One of the highlights of Debbie's position is the planning of the national sales convention, which includes people from all across the United States, as well as many foreign countries, including Canada, Spain, France, Italy, and Japan. Take a good look at your career choices. That's what Patty McGrath did after four years of college and even one term toward her master's degree. If you want your choice of career positions, you need to be the best you can be. For example, many people type 50 or 60 words per minute. So Patty worked harder and now she types 110 words per minute. Her work in the marketing department means cooperation with the art department in preparing advertising and sales promotion notebooks featuring Janssen male fashions. If you're thinking about applying for a job with Cole of California, two of the first people you'll meet include Karen Carnivale, personnel manager, and her secretarial assistant, Jeanette Cassio. Many of Jeanette's responsibilities revolve around the public, either in person or on the phone. She's usually the first person a prospective employee will meet. Versatility is the key to Jeanette's success, whether she's needed at the switchboard, at the typewriter, or in the testing center. Karen Carnivale began her career very similar to Jeanette. At the age of 17, Karen had secretarial responsibilities in the personnel manager's office of a publishing firm. Today, she is probably one of the youngest personnel managers in the United States. If you dream of being a model, meet Corey Friend, who has the special distinction of being a Cole of California fit model and secretarial assistant. For Corey, this may mean a nine o'clock fitting for a new Cole swimsuit to ensure proper line and fit before the suit goes into manufacture. At 10, she may be on the phone following through with an assignment from the designer and at three, helping prepare sample lines for shipment to any one of Cole's many representatives throughout the country. Rhonda Butler began working at Cole as a clerk typist. Today, she is the advertising and publicity assistant. As you look through national fashion magazines, you'll see Cole's provocative advertisements. Rhonda is the one who answers the many letters and phone calls that reach Cole in response to the ads. Typing, filing, and telephone communications are all part of her day. And a very special part right now is putting the final touches on a segment of the Johnny Carson Show, which will feature Cole of California. Chanel, Charlie, Coke. What do they all have in common? An enormously professional advertising campaign. McCann Erickson Worldwide is the fourth largest advertising agency in the world. Headquartered in New York, McCann Erickson operates nine full-service offices in the United States. One of those offices is in Portland, Oregon, 
where Sonia Vandola is executive secretary to Charles Heinrich. She began her secretarial training in high school and in business college increased her shorthand skills to between 140 and 160 words per minute. When asked for characteristics which ensure success, Sonia recommended that every executive secretary needs to be a pro on the telephone. She also needs to be friendly, diplomatic, and professional. Secretary, executive secretary, executive, why not? This decade has seen more secretaries attain middle and upper management positions. Former secretaries like Laura Broad, who have shown an interest in their companies and who have proven themselves in their positions. As sales manager with the Sheraton, Laura travels to the West Coast on sales trips and throughout the neighbor island's properties meeting with travel agents and becoming involved with special promotions such as golf tournaments, tennis tournaments, and marathons. Formerly executive secretary to the general managers of the Sheraton Moana and Surfrider Hotels, Edna Wong, real estate properties manager for Sheraton Hotels in Hawaii, is responsible for negotiating the leases and agreements for 200 boutiques, gift shops, restaurants, discotheques, and concessions in the Sheraton Hotels. Like many young women today, Edna's position in management was preceded by secretarial positions. Combine music, art, and business, gain experience as an executive secretary to the McCann Erickson Advertising Research Department, and you too may become an account executive like Linda Neer. Linda used her secretarial skills to work her way through college. Her typing and shorthand speeds of over 100 words per minute landed her a job as an executive secretary with the Wall Street Journal. From there, she came to McCann Erickson as an executive secretary in the advertising research department. As an account executive, Linda works with the advertising specialists and the clients to develop the campaign they want, whether it's a magazine layout, a billboard, a radio or television commercial. A highly respected woman bank president who started as a secretary has this advice. You reach the executive suite by the road called hard work, a trail which may include carbon paper and typewriter ribbons. The secretarial arena is what the secretary wants it to be. It may be a stepping stone to another career, but for all aspirants to the secretarial field, it can be an exciting and rewarding career. Secretary, executive secretary, executive. Each one is a VIP who developed important business skills. You can too. Wow, that was something else. Um, <laughs> <coughs> There's not a year. I couldn't find a year on it. Maybe somebody saw it. If you did, just chime in. But uh, here's, here's the notes, the teacher's notes or questions that you ask afterwards. VIP, today's secretary. Let me, I'm going to start rewinding uh, while we do this. Uh, so anyways, so here's some questions that you can ask yourself. Uh, if you could live and work anywhere in the world, anywhere is underlined, where would you choose? If you could work for any, underlined, company, which company would you choose? If you could have any job with these companies, which job would you choose? Uh, review the following questions to familiarize yourself, then write answers as you would see them uh, appear in the film. So there's things like, how many secretaries are there in today in the United States? How many openings will there be for secretaries this year? What type of kind of responsibilities do these secretaries have? Who is the largest employer in the country? Um, <clears throat> what I think is fascinating about this film is, uh, you know, it's definitely 70s. Um, 
And when you look at other films from the 40s and 50s about secretaries, because there's a bunch of films, and it's almost entirely aimed towards uh, young women who are in uh, high school or they're in kind of pre-college or junior college. Uh, and it's basically, this is the job that you'll do until you get married. That's the idea. It's like you do your secretary until you get married and then you start having a family and then, you know, you're not a secretary anymore. Or maybe you will be if you as ascend. But a lot of women, this was, you know, according to these films, this is what their their career path are. So it's fascinating that these this film is trying to lure people into being secretaries by saying like, hey, the theme park industry is great and think about all the celebrities that you'll meet <laughs> and you know because they mentioned celebrities and and like all the amazing places you could get a job in hawaii and work for the airlines and all this stuff and then men you can do it too it's great uh so a lot of times when i see a film like this i like to kind of do a little bit of extrapolation and i've always felt that a film well, here's another thing there's another VIP thing. It has an envelope. Sometimes you find interesting things in films. What is this? Oh, it's a brochure. <laughs> Ooh. All right, let's see what they say is the promotional materials for this. I have to put my glasses on. VIPs, today's secretaries, is the most dynamic 15-minute 16 millimeter color career film you've ever seen <laughs> okay i kid you not that's what it says right there <laughs> you've ever seen vip today secretaries will introduce your high school audiences to the real excitement challenge and opportunity which awaits well-trained secretaries as the uh, with progressive companies today just watch your audience expressions when they meet and hear successful, successful secretaries with United Airlines, Sheraton Hotels, Janssen, McCann, Erickson, and Cole of California. But VIP's Today Secretaries doesn't stop there. Every single one of these sentences is basically punctuated with an explanation point. Your high school audiences will also meet executives who began their careers as secretaries. You'll never find a more motivational career film than VIPs today's secretaries. Try it. We're sure you'll agree. Wow, that is phenomenal. Um, we don't always get, you know, so sometimes in the film cans, we get like, you know, program notes or teacher's notes. But to actually get an ad, this is just hilarious. Wow. Um, so... <laughs> Perhaps you've considered a career in uh, secretaries. All right. Thank you for indulging me on that, <laughs> reading those materials. Um, they oftentimes, uh, what did I do with the film? Where is it? That one. I guess I'll find it later. Um, there it is. Um, I'm so excited. I just, I'm, I'm all in a tizzy. Um, so, <laughs> the most exciting film you will ever see, career motivational film. Uh, I don't know, that's a challenge. I wonder if I have a, another career motivation film that's more exciting. Certainly there's more exciting careers, but, uh, I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to think about that. Maybe, uh, I can dig that up for a future, a future show. Okay, so this next film we're going to watch is, um... Here's other things that are in the can if the film breaks. Uh, is this film damaged? All right. It's called Last of the Jacks. And no idea what this is. I think I got this from a university library, um, which I got a lot of other interesting stuff. So anybody want to venture a guess what Last of the Jacks is? I cannot read your comments because it's... The computer I have does not have um, the comments of it's running the broadcasting software. So, anyways, enjoy Last of the Jacks.
morning, we could hear those long tin horns for miles calling the jacks to breakfast. They lived in the neighborhood around there, worked in the mill in the summer and in the lumber camp in the winter. I needed work for the winter, and I knew that the foreman of the camp and his brother-in-law so we went up to the camp and got a job there. Spent the winter with them. And I got into the kitchen and was coffee maker for the camp. So he'd cook. I'd get up an hour before breakfast time and fry pancakes, steak, warmed up potatoes, bread, and drop cakes. Donuts were for supper. That was the breakfast. My first trip to a lumber camp was in about 1907. The camp foreman, Big Otto, sat across from me. As I was eating my second piece of pie, he said, more logs have been sawed with pork and beans than ever was with pie. Yeah. Just push and pull it all. <laughs> and stand on your two feet. Don't put too much weight on you. Know. Try to cut too fast. Kill the other fellow off. The purpose of the undercut is to guide the tree. Then, after I cut the undercut, then I cut it on the other side. Well, then I hold a, hold a timber and I run away. Just before it fell, it hung there like it was stuck between the clouds and the snow. I yelled, she's skybound. My dad took his, the money and came to this country. It was somewhere in 1903. He spent all his money on his fare. So when he got to this camp, he didn't have enough money to buy a pair of mitts, but he, he worked barehanded that winter in the woods. He said it was awful cold, but he said he got kind of used to it. Cold weather didn't bother us very much with all the good grub we had. Well, we had everything ready in the cook shack, you know, and just about uh, depends how far you had to go in the woods, you know, to hold the lunch. We had everything ready, and then uh, what they call swing thing go came in, and it was all in cans covered up. And as soon as we put that stuff in the box, he closed the box and put a horse blanket over it and uh, drove just as fast as he could to the lunch ground how far he had to go. The loading crew would probably be a spare man or to build up a big, good big fire so we had and logs to set on around there. And we'd have uh, roast pork, roast beef, and uh, boiled potatoes, and lots of good gravy, and pies of all kinds, donuts, and hot coffee, everything I might have brought. So we really ate good. About uh, 1917, I first went into the woods for the winter months. So we'd get, uh, get our brush all cut, big crews of men going along with scythes, cutting down the small brush and the grass, getting it out of the way for the rut cutter to come through. And when we came through with the rut cutters, why, uh, we'd have anywhere from 24 to 36 head of horses strung out. And then, of course, after the rut cutting was done, then we'd start tanking, spilling the water. And we never hauled a log until after Christmas. So we had at least a foot and a half or two feet of ice built up. The first thing we did was take our first four horses and rack our sleigh off to the right usually. And I used this little starter. This is just a common ordinary hazel brush and I'd switch them up with that. My leaders get them lined up, get them back on the road, and get on the old sled on the stand behind my pole team and 
Hey, all right, boys. Let's let's go. Down I'd go, down the ice road to the landing on the lake. Well, they had several drives, you know, every spring. See, they'd uh, deck the logs in the winter on the bank, either lake or river, and then in the spring when I was to come and break out the rollways and pick them along to pick out the jams and take them down through. Come all ye jolly good shanty boys, come listen to my song. For it's all about the shanties and the way they get along. For a jolly crew of fellows never can you find. And those real good shanty boys are cutting down the pine. The choppers and the sawyers, they lay the timbers low. The skidders and the swampers, they holler to and fro. Next comes the sassy loaders before the break of day. Come load up your teams, me boys, into the woods they sway. For the broken ice is floating, our business is to try. Three hundred able-bodied men are wanted on the drive. With cant hooks and with jam pikes, these noble men do go and risk their sweet lives on some running stream, you know. I knew men who rode to their death on white water, went down pipe poles and all. Johnny Brewald crossed himself three times before he jumped on the logs. These old, this old dam you see to my right, looking down the river, was built to raise the water levels to ease, more easily float the logs in the mill. These piling you see, they were a, a sort of a retaining wall to hold the booms. This area right here is where the bull chain went up in the sawmill. The logs used to come right out of the water in years past and conveyed into the sawmill. thing was to get your pine to the mill, you see. Best way you could. If it couldn't go by water, it'd go by rail. We came with our trains from the Vermilion branch. We used to drive down over this place here at a quite a rapid rate of speed for this area in order to get the loads up over that hill over there. And we used to call it two streaks of rust and a wooden road bed. There were several uh, camps in there on this line, and one of the largest was the one that Finn Matt run. That was Finn Matt's uh, camp. He was a good fellow to work for. Hard worker himself, and he was good to the men when they were working. We used to get up and get out in the morning at 6.30, 7 o'clock, be on the road. And if you had a good day, you'd get in by 6. If you had a poor day, it might be 9.30, 10 o'clock, where you'd get in at night. They'd have cold roast or hash for supper. Orders were no talking at the table. And if they'd start up a conversation, we, Pete would take the cleaver and he'd walk down along the table, you know, very slow. <laughs> and see the fellas cast a glimpse of him. And, They'd shut up awful quick. Back in the bunkhouse, there'd be talking, all right, and storytelling. Game of dice sometimes. Smoke till the air was blue. I remember the stink of wool socks drying. Someone had a fiddle. 
Now and then, we'd head for town. Got my picture taken. Anybody that had an old cap when sleeping in a chair while well, you lose your hat right there. After a drunk, you always had to buy a new hat. Oh, it was just a woolly town. Oh, I knew all the saloon keepers and common trash, just about all I remember. Drink all you can get and steal what you can, can't get. Mostly cat houses. Nobody there but Peggy now. Yes, she's had more men than names. Must be a lonesome job living in a joint like. You know, I was young then. They'd come in maybe once a year. Goose make hands, fight only. Go tooth nails and whiskey John. And Tamarack Slim, I knew all those people. They're all dead now. Sundays, we boiled our clothes. Drive out the lice, you know. For oh, God so loved the world. Sometimes the sky pilot came around with his Bibles. I went to a logging camp, and uh, they were very good to me. First of all, he says... As he looked at me, he said, you little runt, you will never, never make a lumberjack. I said, no, I don't want to be a lumberjack. I said, what I'm really after is I want to work in the camp. So he kept me for supper that night, and then he told me next morning to help the cook sweep the kitchen, wash the dishes, and so forth. I did that for a little while, and then... He came to me one day and he says, I understand that you are an ordained minister. I says, yes, but who told you? Well, none of my business and so forth and so on. Then he told me, tonight you preach in the camp. Their favorite hymns were old time ones. And then when we were singing, uh, I found out some of them were singing in Finnish, some Norwegian, some Swedish. At first, it kind of disturbed me. But after that, uh, I said to myself, oh, what's the difference? Let them sing. Huh, look at that. So, lumberjacks. That's what that was. 
<clears throat> so, um, yeah, like we, you, you don't know. So, going by the title, Last of the Jacks, I was in kind of thinking that it was maybe Lumberjacks, but I didn't know for sure. So, uh, there you go. Um, you know, those pieces are really nice. They uh, were often state-produced or got grants from uh, national agencies to kind of capture what we were losing culture-wise. Um, and so we run across some of those. They're pretty great. Let me see what's happening back here. Sounds like something's falling apart. No, we're good. Okay. Um, so one of the things you've been missing uh, while you're watching the films is me trying to open some of these cans that are rusted shut. Uh, normally, if a film is completely rusted shut, that is a warning sign that you do not want to open it because it's going to stink. Uh, basically, what happens is it becomes, it forms this airtight seal, and then the film, which is uh, has an acetate base, begins to deteriorate and off-gas, and that creates this super stinky uh, acetic acid smell, which is vinegar smell. And if there's no way for it to kind of get out, it just... It, what happens is it starts to crystallize, and then you see the film warp in this weird way, which is called facetine or diamonding. Um, it is, or, or uh, spoking, I think it's also called. Uh, it's, it's not pleasant. Um, and <laughs> so, so far we've been pretty good. Like, they've just been tight to get off, so I have to use a screwdriver to kind of pull it out. So, um, again, this is, you know, films that I have not that I get, you know, and they go to different parts of the archive. And this one uh, basically was, uh, you know, in a part that I haven't, haven't explored recently. Um, and what happens is I oftentimes get hundreds of films at a time, so I log them into the database, but I don't watch them because I just don't have time. Uh, and then I get hundreds more films, and, and I might pull like one or two films from one collection or another collection, and just because they sound interesting. Uh, but, yeah, it's like constant, constantly have to watch these things. Uh, that's the key. Collecting them, saving them from landfills is one thing, but actually watching them, and in my case, I want to show them, which is why we do these things. Um, so tell your friends that we're doing this. All right, this next film might be General Electric. I can't tell. The can was kind of rusted. Um, I thought I saw a General Electric logo, but we'll see. Uh, I should say this, if you like uh, what you're watching, uh, some ways you can help. One way is to um, basically tell other people, uh, share the stream, uh, either on YouTube or uh, Facebook, or I'm, I guess I'm on Twitch now, so um, hey you guys on Twitch. Uh, who are normally looking at video games and hot Asian girls eating food, um, share this with your friends and tell people about it. We try to do this once a month, uh, and it's a lot of fun for me. But if you like what you saw, one way that you can help, besides sharing and telling people about what we do, is uh, there's a Patreon link right there. Uh, if you go there, uh, Patreon is kind of like a tip jar subscription service. Uh, and what that does is that monthly people contribute like five bucks each. Uh, and I have a number of people who are doing it, um, which thank you so much for continuing to support us. And what we do is we buy films on eBay, we buy equipment, we pay for internet. Um, and there's a service I'm using called Restream, which actually allows me to stream to three different places. And I might be streaming to more places in the future uh, if people say like, oh, you should stream here or you should stream there. Um, so your support is helping us get these films out to more and more people. So thank you for that. Uh, so lighting, here we got. Let me thread this puppy up. As you can see, this is live. We're actually watching films. We're not watching a file or a DVD. We're actually watching the film itself. So, you know, the colors you see in some films in the past, the colors have faded. Um, there's splices, there's dirt, there's hair. Um, this is so. This hasn't really been prepped. I literally pulled this off the shelf, pried open the can, and I'm bringing it to you in its uh, glory or um, 
misery. So enjoy lighting. understand. Lightning was one of these. Terrifying, unearthly, an Olympian power used by the warring gods to destroy each other. But in the age of reason, man overcame his fears and began to strip the cloak of mystery from the fire that split the heavens. It started in 1752, when Franklin's kite string captured a sample of lightning from me by men of science. 200 years ago, as today, research was the key to progress. With the simple means at his disposal, Franklin guided the weapon of the gods to Earth and trapped a fragment in glass and metal foil and identified it as electricity. More than a century passed. Then, in 1879, a miracle was performed on the public square of Cleveland, Ohio. Men and women could walk around and see by electricity after the sun went down. But it soon became clear that electricity could never work its miracles for the people of America, while thunderbolts from the skies crashed unchallenged at man's newly harnessed power. Night and day, the Earth is bombarded by lightning. 6,000 times a minute it strikes. Lightning, uh, of course, is, uh, is an extremely variable phenomenon. When the complete lightning flash is formed, which may in fact be several miles long, uh, a large amount of light is released and noise, which we know as thunder. Its primary objective in the discharge is to pass from the cloud to the earth. And it is going to get there by any means. The currents that may reach values of 100 or 200,000 amperes, although normally not quite that large. And these individual strokes last for times on the order of tens of microseconds. We get a repetitive operation here, or a repetitive phenomena that takes place. Now, it is these individual strokes that have not only the very high current, but give the explosive burning and blasting effects that you observe if you're fortunate or unfortunate enough to be right in the vicinity of a lightning flash. The voltages, uh, of course, are as high as the voltage has to be to uh, cause the flow of that much current. Since you drew your last breath, lightning struck the earth somewhere a hundred times. Nature generates electricity in the clouds. Inside this thunderhead, turbulent air currents are at work. Raindrops are swept upward, uniting and disuniting, forming positive and negative electrical charges. In this separation and concentration of charges, 
cloud to earth capacitor becomes charged. Negative usually in the cloud and an equal but opposite positive charge in the earth below. When the voltage becomes high enough, the capacitor discharges in a flash of lightning. Lightning may strike any place whatsoever. Uh, in urban areas where the population is high and where it could be a, a, a bothersome problem, uh, normally strikes to the high structures, which are in general grounded structures. Well, some of the things that a practical engineer has to be concerned about on transmission lines are how often is this transmission tower going to be hit and how much voltage is produced between the electrical conductors and the, the supporting hanger for the towers. He really wants to be sure that the voltage never gets high enough to cause a breakdown of this electrical insulation because if it does, your lights are going to go out for a while. About half the strokes are single, the rest multiple, having from 2 to 42 successive discharges along the same path. But whether multiple or single in character, a lightning discharge begins with a stepped leader. In most instances, this leader steps earthward in a series of hesitating movements. On contact, current retracing the leader path from earth to cloud builds up within millionths of a second to thousands of amperes, a violent and destructive force. When lightning strikes an overhead power line, the insulators may be flashed over Wooden poles may be split. Another damage may be wrought by high voltage, invisible traveling waves that move at the speed of light. Surprisingly, lightning doesn't actually have to strike a line to cause high voltage waves. Within the cloud to earth electrostatic field, a concentration of earth charges called a bound charge accumulates on the power line. When lightning discharges the cloud in any direction, the electrostatic field collapses and the bound charge is released. High voltage waves then travel over the line in opposite directions. Then, in blueprint fundamentals, when a wave reaches a grounded line end, its voltage drops to zero and the wave is reflected back with reverse polarity. On reaching an open line end, it is increased to double voltage and reflected back over the line practically unchanged. If the voltage is high enough to cause line flashover, the wave is chopped. Part is reflected back with opposite polarity, but the wave front continues on toward the station. If a wave reaches an unprotected transformer, a similar reflection occurs. The voltage is almost doubled and nearly doubles the steepness of the wave front, causing high stresses between the turns and coils of the winding. These lightning and surge voltage stresses in electrical apparatus must be held to safe levels by lightning arresters. Those vital guardians against apparatus destruction and power interruptions. Inside this modern station type lightning arrester are two essential parts. A thyrite valve element and a series gap unit having pre-ionizing elements that accurately control gap sparkover. At normal power voltage, thyrite acts as an insulator, preventing bypassing of power current. But when lightning strikes the power circuits, the gaps spark over, and with the overvoltage impact, thyrite's resistance automatically decreases, and it instantaneously becomes an excellent conductor, discharging the lightning current harmlessly to ground. At the end of the lightning discharge, the thyrite valve closes by the increase of its resistance to normal, and the gaps extinguish the small follow current. Over and over again, the arrester can perform this protective operation whenever lightning or surge voltages occur, always preventing any disturbance of the power flow to consumers. When lightning arrester and transformer are widely separated in terms of circuit feet, voltage passes the arrester and reaches the transformer where it nearly doubles by reflection and contains an oscillation caused by charging the transformer capacitance through inductance of the circuit. But when the lightning arrester is connected close to the transformer or other apparatus to be protected, the protection afforded 
will be most efficient. The double voltage stress by reflection is prevented and the oscillation is negligible. When aircraft are struck by lightning, the oncoming lightning flash usually attaches itself to one of the outward extremities of the aircraft. The lightning current then flows through the aircraft skin and structure and exits out of usually another extremity and proceeds on its way. The aircraft is quite capable of carrying the several hundred thousand amperes even of natural lightning current provided that at various critical we make sure that proper protection and control of the lightning current flow is afforded. This current only and therefore we only have to carry it for that period of time. We inside the aircraft do not feel any differences of potential as this current flows through the aircraft and are safe from any damaging effects. Can you visualize this model as a tree? Well, if you can, the first thing that you sh should be aware of is be sure that you never stand underneath of an isolated tree. What very frequently happens is the lightning hits the tree, the tree is a poor conductor, and it jumps across to the poor unfortunate individual and goes through him, and that has a good chance of killing the person. Another uh, area where people do not fully appreciate the danger is on golf courses, and uh, particularly if they're on the high hill and swinging a metal club now this also presents a path for the discharge of the cloud through the metal club and through the golf. There is one other point I'd like to mention, that if a person is hit by lightning, he can often be resuscitated, literally brought back to life, if he is given artificial resuscitation. The uh, inside of the automobile appears to be the safest place, uh, also being the home is safe. But in with the automobile protection, uh, you're inside of a metal casing. And uh, if the lightning should strike the, the car top, the lightning will be directed through to ground around the metal casing. And that is the path of least resistance. Lightning is not all bad. There's a tremendous amount of beauty in a lightning storm. If you're in a safe position, you can really enjoy the, the pyrotechnics, the spectacle, the random flashing, the intensity of the lighting, the extension and the rumbling of the thunder, it can be very beautiful. Oops, wasn't expecting that. <laughs> the film just kind of ended. Um, so, uh, there was a weird kind of like warble during the whole film. Um, and it's because the film, I don't know if you saw while you're watching it on the, uh, on the right hand of the screen, there was a, uh, this constant like kind of, oh God, how can I do this? I'm all backwards looking at myself on the screen. It's this, there was like this, God, hold on. What side am I on? All right, here. There was like this constant like ripple tear. And so what had happened was somebody ran this film either uh, the wrong way uh, or they ran it uh, through a silent projector, which has a uh, perforate, it has a, uh, so you can see, uh, hold on, let me s switch over. Um, so you can see there's this, you see on the right hand side, you see these little tears going past. That's where there were uh, sprockets on both sides and they basically perforated, um, perforated the film. And that's where the soundtrack is. So you get this sound. Um, so let me start rewinding this. Okay. Um, so there's a lot 
to learn about lightning. And, you know, I got the title wrong. Like, it was written on the can wrong. It was written lighting. And I thought, ooh, that's cool. Lighting. But no, it was lightning. Um, so. That was pretty cool. And this one, of course, was another very rusted can. Uh, one of the things we also buy uh, uh, from your donations are uh, new cans that are uh, plastic, uh, kind of a um, type of plastic that doesn't interact with the film at all um, and uh, allows for them to vent so that you don't get that buildup of the acetic acid smell, like off-gassing. Um, so, lightning. Uh, somebody noted, uh, said on the comments, which I appreciate, I like the comments, thank you. Um, somebody wrote that uh, their kid said, that, is that where the sepia filter came from? It's funny, um, remember back when Instagram was just an app on your phone and uh, it was basically something that would simulate... Uh, bad film stock or the, the, the artifacts of bad film like a purple you know that you would see sometimes with Polaroid or a uh, weird color um, so you could say yes the sepia there's there were silent films that were actually tinted um, and not just sepia they were tinted uh, other colors too like yellow they would like tint the stock so they'd be yellow, blue, green red and that would help set the mood for a film. Um, and then actually even earlier than that, um, they would hand paint the frames. So uh, that's even crazier. You have these factories in the early 1900s where, pe where women mostly were painting individual frames of 35 millimeter film. And it was, you know, it was pretty cool. Um, it wasn't, you know, Talking about an image that's like, like that big, so it's not really big. All right, I got the talkies. I'm talking a bunch. All right, this next film is called um, Ecology Lady, and I have a series of films about ecology that are all around this link, and they were all the ones I've seen so far were made by Les Blank, who was a documentary filmmaker who passed away, who did. Um, Werner Herzog eats his shoe, uh, did a Gap Tooth Women, uh, a series of other kind of interesting 70s documentaries, and then uh, documentaries about musicians, uh, blues and uh, folk musicians, um, and then passed away. And then his son sent me a cease and desist <laughs> on YouTube for putting on a film that Les Blank had done that was in public domain. And we had a nice talk, and I actually met Les Blank, so I was like, okay, yeah, I'll take it down if you make it available in some other way, which they did. Uh, so anyways, this is called Ecology Lady. I'm guessing that Les Blank did this, but it's possible that he didn't, and it was just part of this other series. So enjoy. Get rid of $31 billion worth of container materials and used packages every year. 300,000 tons of aluminum cans, cans. A total of 65 billion cans. 36 billion glass containers. How to simplify and economize on solid waste collection and disposal. How to recycle these valuable resources. Solution. Start a recycling center. Here on a gloomy, rainy Saturday morning, 
A recycling center is being established by a group of environmentally oriented volunteers on a shopping center parking lot at Tyson's Corner in Fairfax County, Virginia. It's sponsored by the Vienna, Virginia Environmental Council, the Western Environmental Movement, the Great Falls Civic Association, and the Drainsville Environmental Force. Question, will it work? Can a group of volunteers organize a recycling program, keep it going, and remain solid? It's now five weeks later. The word's out. Citizens have begun to make a Saturday morning habit of their family visit to the Tyson's Corner Recycling Center. Recycling is big today. The environmentalists are all for it. Municipal officials fighting the solid waste battle are all for it. But somehow, it doesn't seem quite real. It's a dream, an ideal, which hasn't yet materialized. Perhaps the little local recycling center, operated by eager volunteers, will spark the program and get it off the ground on a large scale. This is our ecology lady, Mary Carriker, coordinator of the Vienna Environmental Council. A few weeks ago, Mary had never crushed a can or broken bottles with a sledgehammer. But in the last five weeks, she's learned a lot. It's worthwhile. You go home at night and you feel like you've really put in a, a good day's work, and there's a satisfaction in that. But there are cynics who disbelieve. Experienced dealers in secondary materials know how hard it is to get a market for recycled materials, how expensive transportation and processing are. Industrial practices are difficult to change. Citizen cooperation is uncertain when personal inconvenience is involved. Today's facts are disconcerting. 6% of aluminum cans are being recycled. Tin can recycling is insignificant. We're starting to recycle glass, but the program is still in its infancy, and it's predicted that the returnable bottle will be obsolete in five years. Only about 5% of our newsprint is being reclaimed. So you want to start a recycling center? Here are the hard facts from a gal who's operating one, Mary Character. This is a scene we call recycling in Northern Virginia on a hot spring morning. Uh, we have a coalition of environmental groups here who have come out and they're breaking glass, they're collecting newspapers, they're smashing aluminum cans, and all of this will be sent to various factories around the country for recycling. Our glass is shipped all the way to Baltimore, Maryland, where it will be melted down and made into new glass for bottles, building materials, glass fault road materials. Our newspapers we sell to a firm in Washington, D.C. They take it and make new newsprint out of it. They make uh, cardboard, other building materials. Aluminum is a valuable resource, and the aluminum will be melted down and remade into aluminum products. There's a lot of work involved here. We're normally short-handed in our projects. Uh, many people talk about doing something about the environment, but not many of them show up on a weekend here. Now, what we're trying to do is involve more of the citizenry, not only in bringing us their items for recycling, but also when they bring us the items for recycling, to stay a minute with us here and help us work on this project. It's very eye-opening. The young people, haven't turned out in the numbers we had hoped they would. The high school students seem interested in it, but after a few weeks, they just haven't shown up as they did to begin with. We have many problems in organizing all of this. It's a nonprofit group here, and uh, we find ourselves in the hole after about five weeks of operation. We hope by the end of the month that we will be in the hole, making a little money to pay for some of our equipment that we have and also to buy more barrels. Some of the other projects that we have going around in this area are right now standing still because all of our capital is in this operation. 
Now, recycling as such is rather new in this part of the country, and we need a little bit of help from the manufacturers and the trucking companies and people such as these. We have lots of problems involved in this recycling. Some of the main ones, which might not seem very large, are the fact that many of the bottles we receive have this metal ring on them, and it takes quite a bit of time to take that off. Uh, we have to separate our glass into brown and green, which is time consuming and uses up many of our barrels. And we think this is a nice color. It's called blah green, and it's a mixture of the brown and green. And if we could ever get people used to using a bottle like this, we would save ourselves quite a bit of work in recycling this glass. We've run into problems with people wanting to bring us tin cans. This is a real pain in the neck for us. The can companies run full page ads in the newspapers saying that they will take the cans. And it sounds good in print, but when you come out here, you find that we have to pay for the trucks to haul these cans. There are ICC regulations governing trucking salvage materials across state lines. For volunteer groups, some of these problems are just really hard to overcome. Now, we hope sometime to be able to take the tin cans. They don't pay enough right now for us to be able to afford to truck them out of here. And so people bring us cans, and we have to make them angry when we say, no, we just can't possibly take them now. We don't have the money or the manpower to ship them up there. We've had problems in uh, getting help out here with some of our, our projects. We've contacted many local groups in this area, and they want to bring us their glass. They think this will help us, and in a way it will, but we need the manpower when they bring the glass out, and we need the help. We have many groups contacting us, asking how they can go on in their areas and recycle. They're going to run into a lot of the obstacles we have with the manufacturers, such as the ICC regulations involving interstate uh, transport of salvageable materials. These are almost impossible to overcome sometimes. It costs quite a bit to get a license to haul materials, and luckily we're in with another group who's been able to solve some of this and trucks our glass for us. The manufacturers could help us more by pushing the, the returnable bottles instead of so much push on the non-returnables. It's all well and good to recycle bottles, but it seems pretty wasteful to use a very good bottle once and then break it up, melt it down, and make a new bottle out of it. It just doesn't seem right to us. We're doing very well with our newspapers. We've collected some 20 tons of newspapers in the last five weeks, and uh, about seven tons of glass, and I'd say around 200 pounds of aluminum. So we're off to a real bang-up start, and the only thing that will slow us down will be if our volunteers just quit showing up. We get lots of letters and calls from people wondering whether it's advisable for them to start a recycling center in their area. We think it is. There are many areas that you can look to for help. There are groups in the large cities where they have ironed out some of the wrinkles in this recycling project, and they can help you find sales places for your glass and aluminum and newspapers. If not, you might try the yellow pages in the local phone directories. They're, they're help look up junkyards, salvage yards, find out if there is a market in your area or within a truckable distance. Now, volunteers are a problem. I've mentioned that. Try to get several local clubs or groups to back you and make them sign up people to help you on this. There are many books and articles written on recycling now. Try and get your hands on a few of these. Now, I would say it may look a little bleak to start with, but uh, it's a good feeling, and we think it's good for the country. And so I would merely say right on. American industry faces a challenge, which was put to verse by an employee of one of our big can companies. A proposal for disposal is what we dearly crave. For package items, we've a glut from cradle to the grave. So give us now a package new that holds the product well. But after it has served that use, it blows itself to hell. Hey, Jane. You look fresh. Would you like to go up to my car and get the jug of ice water and the paper cups off the front seat? It's a green and white station wagon up there. I don't know if the water is still icy or not, but I've been... <laughs> Hey, 
Hey. Um, so I was wrong. That was not a less blank film. Uh, but it's part of a lot of films that were made in the uh, early 70s, uh, part of the ecology movement. I don't know if you noticed she, the ecology lady, had an uh, ecology button, that little logo. of the, It's an E. It's a circle with an E, a slash through it. It looks like an E. I remember there being an ecology flag, which is like the American flag with that symbol where the stars would be, and it was green. Um, and so, yeah, this was... Uh, I, the reason why I like watching these films, and, and I actually did a show called The Last Time We Were Green, which was a bunch of films from the 70s that were talking about recycling and talking about uh, pollution and um, like noise and uh, air and water and, <coughs> excuse me, um, also littering. And what was interesting was that uh, a lot of those films actually looked at things that you could see. So it was littering, like roadside littering, and it was, it was unattractive, unappealing. And so, and smoke and smog, that was not, you know, it was, it looked bad. Uh, the smog looked bad. I mean, there were certainly health factors related to it, but it looked bad. Um, and what's interesting is the problem we're running into now is uh, in attempts to, to address some of those issues, uh, we've kind of gotten ourselves in trouble. So... Uh, one way to get rid of litter is to create biodegradable materials. So biodegradable uh, bags, you know, break down into something so they don't look like a bag anymore. Uh, but biodegradable plastic is actually a big problem. Uh, and what happens is big plastic turns into little tiny particles, and those particles get caught in things like fish. Uh, they get caught by coral. They get caught in the sea. They get caught in us. Um, in then the other problem was, well, we have these smokestacks, smokestacks billowing all this smoke, this particle stuff. So we'll have scrub, scrubbers on there that will take care of that. And so what was the thing that they didn't take care of? Uh, carbon dioxide, which uh, is what the problem we're running into now. Uh, there's too much carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere. And uh, so it's getting, it's basically heating up the planet. Uh, what's fascinating is... Uh, I have a film that talks about it. It was a Bell Science film that was made in the late 50s, and it talks about, yeah, we should be careful if there's too much carbon dioxide in the material because it'll be this thing called the greenhouse effect, and it will heat up the planet. Uh, so way back when, AT&T uh, and scientists were like, hmm, this could be a problem. Ecology lady. All right. This film is called Oberbeeren. I think it's a region in Germany. So this film might be, might be in German. Um, ooh, it is stinky. Okay. Uh, somebody asked a question about like what happened to such and such channel. Um, on I, I guess they're assuming on YouTube. Maybe it was Twitch. I don't know. Uh, so let me tell you, uh, we put a lot of our films online, and we do work to make sure that they are in the public domain, meaning that the copyrights have expired or um, there were, never were copyrights. Um, but that does not stop people from saying that, oh, that we own that film. Uh, and I do a lot of work. I'm already on my third YouTube channel, <laughs> like, over the years. Because at first I was like, YouTube is awesome. I'll put anything up there. No, nope, that didn't work. Then I was a little bit more careful, and then that didn't work. And uh, what has happened is it's gotten, it's gotten difficult. I have to do a lot of work to constantly tell people who are doing music videos using my public domain material that I've posted online. Uh, they claim a copyright against it because it's in their music video. So I have to constantly tell people, hey, this film is from the 1940s. And your music video, which is from 2017, uh, you're using public domain footage. I'm not claiming to own what your, your, your music video is, but your YouTube's robots basically say, hey, this is copyrighted, and this, this person, me, 
who posted the thing first and in it, its entirety, I'm the one that's in trouble. So uh, it is possible whoever has been posting stuff uh, on some of these channels, uh, like archival material, not unlike what I post, they're probably struggling with it as well. And they might have gotten in trouble. Um, I am constantly fighting it. Uh, and it kind of doesn't feel like it's worth it, but it is because I, I like to make this stuff available. Uh, and, you know, if someone does have a true grievance, I'll listen to it. But, you know, a lot of stuff that people think that they own, they don't anymore. Uh, because of, of really sensible copyright laws, not like recent copyright laws. All right, I'll get off my soapbox, and we will watch some German films. sind in Oberbayern. Oberbayern ist der südlichste Teil Deutschlands. Hier steigen die Alpen steil aus dem Hügelland. Am Fuße der Alpen liegen viele hübsche Dörfer und stattliche Ortschaften. Diese Ortschaft ist der berühmte Passionsspielort Oberammergau. Die Straße ist sauber, auch die Häuser sind sauber und mit Bildern bemalt. Im Hintergrund der Straße steht eine hübsche kleine Kirche. Die Oberbayern sind meistens Bauern. Die Kühe der Bauern werden auf die Weide getrieben. Die Weiden auf den Bergen heißen Almen. Die Kühe tragen Glocken damit sie der Hirt auf den Almen finden kann. Auch Ziegen gehören zum Besitz der Bauern. Hinter der Herde geht ein alter Hirt. Mit einem Stock treibt er die Ziegen. In Oberammergau gibt es schöne Wirtshäuser für die Bauern und für fremde Besucher. Die Bayern sind fromme Leute. In jedem Ort gibt es eine schöne Kirche. Der Altar dieser Kirche ist wundervoll geschmückt. Nicht alle Kirchen sind so schön wie diese. Auch die Friedhöfe in Oberbayern sind in guter Ordnung. Auf den Gräbern stehen kunstvolle Kreuze und Grabsteine. Jedes Grab ist mit Blumen geschmückt. Dieses Grab am Eingang des Friedhofs trägt ein Kreuz. Dieses Kruzifix ist aus Holz geschnitzt. Auf dem Grabstein stehen die Daten für Geburt und Tod der begrabenen Menschen. Hier sehen wir Männer bei der Arbeit. Der Holzschnitzer mit dem Bart schnitzt ein kleines Kruzifix. Viele Oberammergauer sind Holzschnitzer. Mit einem scharfen Messer schneidet der Künstler in das Holz. Zu so einer Arbeit gehört viel Geschick. Hier sind einige andere Kunstwerke ausgestellt. In der Mitte steht eine große Statue der Jungfrau Maria mit dem Jesuskind. Solch eine Statue heißt auch Madonna. In Oberammergau ist das berühmte Passionsspielhaus. Hier spielen die Oberammergauer die Geschichte vom Leiden unseres Herrn. Dieser bärtige Mann wird in diesem Jahr 
unseren Herrn Jesus Christus darstellen. Er ist ein Holzschnitzer. Alle Passionsspieler sind einfache Einwohner Oberammergaus. Aus dem Laden kommt eine junge Frau. Sie wird die Jungfrau Maria darstellen. Sie erzählt, 1634 wütete die Pest in Bayern. Damals gelobten die Oberammergauer, wenn uns die Pest verschont, werden wir oft ein Passionsspiel aufführen. Oberammergau ist nun aber nicht der einzige Ort in Oberbayern, in dem viele Einwohner Künstler sind. Ein anderes Dorf, Mittenwald, ist wegen seiner Geigenmacher berühmt. Ein alter Meister sitzt in der Werkstatt und arbeitet an einer Geige. Er prüft sie genau und feilt sie sorgfältig. In den bayerischen Alpen liegen viele Seen. Dies ist der Riesersee. Die Berge im Hintergrund sind die Zugspitzgruppe. Im Tal liegt Garmisch-Partenkirchen. Dahinter liegt die Zugspitzgruppe. Die Zugspitze ist Deutschlands höchster Berg. Sie ist 2964 Meter hoch. Auch in Garmisch sind die Häuser bunt bemalt. Hier geht ein bayerisches Ehepaar. Sie gehen zu einem Volksfest. Zu einem Volksfest gehört auch ein Festzug. Diese Gruppe zeigt eine Bärenjagd bei den alten Germanen. Dahinter kommen ein paar Reiter auf schönen Pferden. Eine Musikkapelle spielt. Der Bierkönig fährt auf seinem Wagen im Festzug mit. Das ist ein riesengroßes Bierfass. Dieser Wagen stellt ein Floß dar, auf dem Holz zur Donau gebracht wird. Kleine Kinder gehen im Festzug mit. Sie tragen Blumenbänder. Hier kommt eine andere Musikkapelle. Dahinter gehen Leute in Tracht. Tracht nennt man jene bunten Kleider aus alter Zeit, die Bauern noch heute tragen. Eine Schützenkompanie marschiert hinter der Trachtengruppe. Hier geht eine andere Trachtengruppe. Die Männer tragen die bayerische Nationaltracht, Lederhosen, weiße Hemden und grüne Federhüte. Im Schatten tanzt diese Trachtengruppe einen Volkstanz. Es ist ein Schuhplattler. Nur Männer tanzen einen Schuhplattler. Die Trachtengruppe tanzt einen anderen Volkstanz. Hier tanzen Burschen und Mädchen zusammen. Während die Burschen wieder einen Schuhplattler tanzen, drehen sich die Mädchen im Kreis herum. Während die jungen Leute tanzen, 
sitzen die Älteren im Gasthausgarten und hören der Volksmusik zu. Ein Paar in bayerischer Tracht spielt, der Mann Zitter, die Frau Harfe. Oberbayern ist ein schönes Land. Das hat auch König Ludwig II. erkannt. Hier hat er im 19. Jahrhundert seine Schlösser und die Burg Neuschwanstein gebaut. Diese prächtige Burg ist besonders in Amerika berühmt. Von den Fenstern der Burg hat man einen weiten Blick über das Land. Sieht sie nicht mit ihren hohen Türmen wie ein weißes Märchenschloss aus? Dieses kleine Schloss des Königs von Bayern heißt Linderhof. Im Schlosspark steigt ein Springbrunnen in die Höhe. Es ist ein wundervoller Anblick. Hier ist ein kleiner Springbrunnen und hier ein Wasserbecken mit vergoldeten Figuren. Das prächtigste der bayerischen Königsschlösser ist Herrn Chiemsee. Es liegt auf einer Insel im Chiemsee. Durch eine herrliche Halle treten wir in das Treppenhaus. Wie alles glänzt und funkelt. Die Wände sind aus Marmor. Der Schmuck an den Wänden und an der Decke ist mit Gold überzogen. Dies ist ein Zimmer im Schloss. Von der Decke hängen prächtige Kronleuchter. Wir sind auf einem Alpenberg. Es ist der Predigtstuhl. Auf viele Berge in Oberbayern führt eine Seilbahn. Wir wollen mit der Seilbahn zu Tal fahren. Wir fahren abwärts. Die Seilbahn schwebt hoch durch die Luft. Deshalb heißt sie auch Schwebebahn. Wir nähern uns wieder einem großen Stützpfeiler. An diesen Stützpfeilern hängen die Seile. Auf dem anderen Seil fährt eine Gondel bergauf. Hier fährt eine Gondel in die Talstation ein. Diese Seilbahn heißt Predigtstuhlbahn, weil sie auf den Berg Predigtstuhl hinaufführt. Jetzt sind wir in Berchtesgaden. Hinter der Ortschaft liegt die Watzmann-Gruppe. Bei Berchtesgaden liegt der Königssee. Er ist der schönste der deutschen Alpenseen. Auf dem Königssee fährt ein Boot. Zwei Bayern in Tracht rudern Besucher zu einem kleinen Ort, der hinter dem Königssee liegt. Dies ist der Ort St. Bartholomä am Königssee. Auf einer schmalen Wiese vor der steilen Bergwand liegt eine weiße Kapelle, ein Gasthaus und einige Bauernhäuser. Aber unser Boot fährt wieder ab. Wir müssen Abschied nehmen von St. Bartholomä, vom Königssee und von Oberbayern.
All right, another film caught me off guard. Um, I was uh, pontificating in the comments uh, on uh, one of the sites, and uh, so that caught me off guard. Let me turn off this speaker real quick because it's going to start annoying me. <clears throat> so yeah, you n you never know uh, when when you have a film, what it's going to be, and you know, if, is it going to be in German? Uh, etc. This, this film got a little off, so I need to re-thread this. Um, but uh, some, so on YouTube, people are commenting more about the how some of the channels that featured vintage films or archival films have disappeared recently. And I mentioned that you know you get sometimes these copyright notices. I get copyright notices all the time because of um, background music, uh, and that will oftentimes kick me off of YouTube because uh, somebody at some point was like, hey, there's a bunch of production music. If we license this or we claim that we own it on YouTube, then we get a cut of everybody that uses it, um, which in my case, you know, it's, it's almost like Coronet Films or Encyclopedia Britannica. They all use the same like record over and over and over again, or the same like production music stuff, and so you know the openings all flag and say like, oh, well, this belongs to such and so and so. So there's an amount of ad revenue that goes to those to whoever made that claim. Um, you know, I don't know if they actually did own the copyrights or not, but oh well. Um, but you know, obviously, I'm not in this for the money. Uh, collecting films and showing them to folks like you, uh, you know, the the Patreon donate thing is awesome, but it doesn't pay the mortgage, and it doesn't pay for, you know, the internet that I'm buying. It helps, and I do appreciate anybody who kicks in for that, but, uh, and then the ad revenue from YouTube, I don't know, it's okay. I've had to put a lot, I've put a lot of films online, like, I think it's almost 3,000 films online. And I'm making a little trickle from that. But what happens is you get these copyright claims. And uh, someone who is doing this, it's a labor of love. Even if they don't have the films, they're still trying to find the stuff and all upload it and all this uh, stuff. You know, after a while, they might just get copyright strikes and get kicked off. Um, and I had, at one point, just recently, two copyright strikes that were erroneous. Uh, and I had to reach out to people that reported it, and I had to like say, like, look, um, you have to understand that your film that you're claiming is actually in public domain now, that the people who owned this film back in the day did not register it correctly, so it is in the public domain. Um, and that, and I said I would take the film down just as a courtesy, because they were still making money off of it. Um, but... Uh, you know, it's wrong. They weren't right. Um, but getting copyright strikes, if you get three of them, you're out. What? Now, why does that make sense? Because it's like baseball. Copyright violations are like baseball. <laughs> I don't know. It seems kind of spurious to me. But uh, anyways, that might be why some of these sites are going away. Um, so sorry about that. I'm going to keep doing it until I uh, can't do it anymore. And what will happen is if I can't do it on Facebook or YouTube or whatever the future is, when we beam it into your eyeballs, um, uh, it'll be on the Internet Archive because I put a lot of stuff up there. And coincidentally, that's where a lot of people actually pull the content to put together their own vintage uh, film channel place, which is fine. Because I put up stuff that's in public domain. It's not mine. I didn't make it. So I'm happy that people are using it. Um, that's ultimately what it's about. It's about sharing the films. So. Anyways. I'm happy that you guys tuned in. It makes me happy to show films like this to people. If it was just me watching the films, I probably would have gotten sick of this a long time ago. But it's because other people really like watching the films, and it gives me great joy to share them for laughs, but then also historical stuff, you know, so yay, thanks. All right.
so we're gonna so the next uh, show I'm gonna try to do is gonna be February 25th uh, I think I, I'm not 100% sure on that but you know tune in be a follow me on Facebook uh, follow AV geeks on Facebook or you know check just check um, uh, and I will let you know when the next one is next event is um, this last film is called He Acts His Age, and uh, it's black and white, but I don't know. Is it is it made for adults who are, I don't know, who knows? With a title like that, it's kind of provocative, so I like it. All right, so here's He Acts His Age. Enjoy. Fascinating, infuriating, refreshing, unpredictable. These are our children. Everyone loves them, but how many of us really understand them? Any parent knows that each child is a complete individual, the only in the world. Yet, all these children will find fun in the same field. Some make lone voyages of discovery. Some flock together. The more noise, the better. And for some, the game is the thing. Their play changes as they grow. But wait a minute. What do we know about how children grow? Obviously, they grow in size. With food, sleep, and exercise, their weight increases, muscles toughen, bones harden. We can easily see, too, the changes in a child's appearance as he grows. He loses his baby fatness. His features develop. His beard begins to grow. But do we notice the similar stages in his emotional growth? What kind of food, rest, and exercise do we give for this less obvious but equally important development? At this age, his whole world is people. Yes, how does the baby feel about the only people he knows? Will his attitude now really affect his general happiness later on? A big boy, age two. Now he's finding out about things as well as people. Has he confidence to tackle something new? How can I keep one step ahead of him without discouraging him? Easy. Easy does it, little man. Oh, just when he'd got it, too. Oh, well. Say, what a lot of little black and white things. Just the things to put in here. And soft gray stuff. All goes in here fine. Good. It fits. Oh, that's another box. Maybe it fits too. Yes, it takes a lot of understanding to keep one step ahead of a two-year-old and still give him the experience he's reaching out for. four years old. Now he knows a larger world, the whole neighborhood. And he begins to question the authority of his family. He 
What's happened to him? He was all right last year. Is this rebellion just a phase, or have I done something wrong? He's just growing, that's all. He's bound to assert himself sooner or later, and most of them do it at four. Ten years old. Now he goes beyond his neighborhood. He's in school. He's facing ideas as well as people and things. Ideas like, how many times does 28 go into 4,832? I hardly ever see him nowadays. I wonder if we should make an effort to do more with him. Fifteen years old, nearly an adult. Does he feel respected and independent? If he does, he can make mistakes and still take his place with the group. How can we understand our children well enough and soon enough to help them as they grow up? It's hard to be sure we're doing the right thing. Doctors and teachers, psychologists and social workers have studied the emotional development of thousands of children, so they know pretty well what behavior to expect in the normal child at each stage of growth. And they are passing on this information to us in books, magazine articles, and films about children. Study groups are useful too. Other parents have the same worries, and it's comforting to talk it over with them. And when occasionally a problem is too deep for parents to solve alone, there's a doctor or a child guidance clinic to help. Once we know what to expect, one of the best ways to understand our children is to watch them as they play. In many subtle ways, they reveal to us the stage of their emotional growth. The one-year-old has experienced a world covered with soft rugs and blankets. This new world is interesting, but it's prickly. He needs help. But, on second thought, the new world is fascinating. And there's only one way to find out about it. Two years. Watch him. He's the master of his fate. Whoops! Deep, isn't it? He likes to watch the antics of the other children, but it needs concentration. He'll join in when he's older. At three, the business of imitating grown-ups and learning correct social behavior is very, very serious. Parents' approval is all important. <laughs> but how difficult grown-ups can be. All that fuss over a little water. Children are constantly running into little frustrations like this. But fortunately, they have a natural way of dulling the impact. They act them out in their play. Four-year-olds find endless fun in make-believe. Squashing down the grass, they make a room, a hall, a whole house. And there's sure to be something at hand for bacon and eggs.
And then there are those other fours. <laughs> the kind who make short work of two-gun peat and all other dangerous animals. And this lets off a lot of emotional steam, and it doesn't bother anybody if they're not too close. Sometimes, all of a sudden, their play seems to make no sense at all. Maybe it's sheer joy of living, pent-up energy and excitement that just has to be expressed. Anyway, it's normal. Fives have played tag since man began. Getting away is the most important thing in the world. Except the infinity of strange new wonders all around. At five, he's ready for real work. His father, who knows everything, can teach him exciting, dangerous skills. He wants to feel useful and have important responsibilities. Not for too long at a time, of course, for an older friend always knows of something better to do somewhere else. But that six-year-old leader and man of adventure can still be a baby again for a while. At this stage, his emotions are wavering. One minute he wants to go back to mother, the next to forge ahead on his own. To the nine-year-old, a family gathering in the country may seem just foolish. Will you go and see who's crying? Run along now, hurry up. Always someone crying. In the middle of a good story, too. People should stay at home in comfort. This attitude annoys parents if they don't realize it's normal at this stage. The child may appear resentful and sulky because there's a struggle in her immature mind between her own desires and the increasing responsibility that she feels. The average 10-year-old is fanatically sure of his ideas and his rights. Tolerance comes hard at 10. At times, the 12-year-old may not be interested in games. He is much too busy with vast plans for his heroic future. Fifteen. Even when all has run smoothly so far, life can seem desperately complicated now. There are a hundred small problems to growing up, and any one of them can seem too big. Parents' understanding and sympathy can help children to grow up with strong, resilient characters. Yes, our children are growing emotionally just as surely as physically. And research shows that normally they go through definite stages. In fact, children act their age. And if we know how children usually behave at a certain age, we can better understand our own children and give them the right help at the right time. Step by step, their fiber of character is toughening, growing into maturity. And our job is to give them what help they need, help in straightening out the complications, and help in getting the most out of the experiences of growing up. Fascinating, infuriating, refreshing, unpredictable. These are our children. Everyone loves them, but along with love, they need our intelligent understanding.
So that's Canadian, um, which means that uh, it doesn't quite apply to United States uh, as they're all in metric. So kids um, are different in that country because of the metric system. I'm kidding, of course. Um, so uh, uh, NFBC, National Film Board of Canada, uh, government-sponsored uh, filmmaking group. Uh, people would go, filmmakers, young filmmakers would often pitch their idea to National Film Board of Canada, who would then basically pay for it and do it, um, give them the money to do it. Now, the rights to the film would then belong to the National Film Board of Canada, which means that um, they could distribute it on DVD. They could also show it online. So if you go to nationalfilmboard.ca, you'll see they have a lot of films online that are pretty great, including some amazing animation. Uh, one of my favorite films is Big Snit, um, so you should go check it out, out there. Um, anyways, that's a wonderful example of you know a national entity kind of bolstering filmmakers uh, to do interesting works that captures part of uh, the culture of Canada, but also um, things like some stuff for parents so that they're not freaked out by their kids acting weird at some age. Uh, they did a whole series, uh, a great series, uh, like Trusting Twos and... No, Terrible Twos and Trusting Threes. Uh, they, they do a whole thing up till, I think, about 11 or 12 um, a series of, of things. So this is probably before that series came out. Um... But, uh, yeah, it's pretty great. So, everybody, thanks for uh, watching tonight. Um, I hope to do the next uh, What the AV Geek Saw event on February 25th. I'm not sure of the theme yet. I need to think. Uh, if you're in Raleigh, we're actually doing two uh, VD Valentine's-related things. We're doing something on uh, Valentine's Day uh, called it's AV Geeks Get Rift Off, uh, films about dating and love on of course valentine's day and there'll be what we'll do is we'll show these films and then comedians uh will riff on the films that they've not seen so um that should be fun uh we did this before it was an experiment and it was actually pretty funny um then that following so that's on the 14th and on the 20th we're doing a screening called um uh the vd after vd so it's venereal disease films um which is one of my favorite genres so it's a bunch of uh, stuff, probably from the 60s and 70s. It's going to be a lot of uh, maybe some military stuff, too. I don't know. We'll see. I, I, I'll, th I'll figure it out when I, when I get there because I have so many. I probably have 50 or 60 venereal disease films. Um, and they, they're almost all great for different reasons. Uh, so, yeah, if you're in Raleigh, that's a great thing to check out. Otherwise, uh, I'll see you again February 25th. If you like what you saw, you can go to avgeeks.com and we'll talk about what the next event will be and if we come up with a theme on the 25th what that will be also there's other events that we do in raleigh at the science museum at, at nc state's hunt library uh and then if you'd like to contribute um thanks to some of you who uh, tuned in tonight that i know have contributed to us on patreon and continue to do so that's very much appreciated we spend that money uh usually on film related stuff sometimes beer i don't know toilet paper you know, stuff that makes an archive go, lubricates an archive. Um, yeah, so thanks so much, and hope to see you again soon. I, I, I think we licked the, uh, the problem with the thumping sound and the um, lip sync for the most part. Uh, so I hope everybody had a good uh, streaming experience, because we're just now beginning to figure out what that's all about. So see you again. Uh, thanks. Have a good February.